met Peter about 20 years ago. Um, he was, he was hilarious. He was kind. He had wit, savoir faire, and he had this, this charm that drew people to him in droves. His name was on everyone's lips for years and years and years. They just wanted to be close to him, just to hear what was going to pop out of his mouth next. He wrote really solid songs, really good songs, um, and they were just, they were timeless. He was incredibly funny and witty, and uh, you should be very proud. Peter had an enormous, he exuded sex. An enormous sex appeal. Women found him very attractive. When you think about his life and you think about what he lived through and what he became and how he took it all and put it in his work, you know, even in one song, Tenterfield Sadler, you know. And he just rose to the occasion of life, you know. He just made every moment count like the song he wrote, and he really did live that. Oh, he was, he was a tease, and he was saucy, and uh, he was brave, and boy, was he talented. And uh, it was flamboyant, it was described in many ways, and I think there might have been people who would have said, tone it down a bit, change it a bit, maybe it's too bizarre, too flamboyant. He stuck with it, and without compromise, he got to the top in America. I was a very normal Australian child when I was in Australia. All Australians are normal when they grow up. I'm telling you, out in the bush there, chasing the kangaroos and all that stuff, eating koala bears for lunch. So, picture this. My, my grandfather sitting on the veranda, sewing saddles, and me next to him, little eight-year-old boy, tap dancing. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, so I, he was good at telling stories. He used to tell me stories and stuff to try and keep me quiet. Didn't work too good, but I, instead of going into saddle making, I guess I went into storytelling. And I had to draw the curtains and announce him to who he was, see? And uh, he'd really perform and come out with one day his mother's dress on. <laughs> you know? So yeah. really, he, he, was, he was an entertainer right from a, a young boy. I love the piano. I love the piano. I love to hear somebody play. A bar piano. A grand piano. It's in the gallery. play piano from the age of four. He played purely by instinct and he was encouraged by his mother, Marion. Peter got his values and above all, his sense of humor from Marion. Marion, that was eight misbehaving we heard then, played of course by Fat Swaller. Now why did you select that particular piece of music to introduce you here tonight? That was the first record that Peter ever bought and played on his uh, record player and he used to play it for hours. <laughs> was he a good student at school? Uh, <laughs> yes. Average, average, very average, brilliant. very average. Brilliant. Brilliant? <laughs> no, average. <laughs> but he'd much rather go to the movies and, and enjoy his music than play sport. <laughs> <laughs> you gathered that. <laughs> now, Marion, you watched Peter's climb to international success. Yeah. What do you think of your son now? <laughs> six years of age and he found that I had a dancing school and uh, and the next thing I knew that he uh, he came to see me and I could tell that he was loaded with rhythm he was very flexible he was he was just full of wanting to dance as I remember it he started singing and playing the piano in the New England Hotel 
possibly around the age of 10 or 11. The family moved to the town of Armadale, New South Wales, after Peter's father came home from the war. Dick Woolno was a troubled man. He found it difficult settling back in. Way back in the good old days, before the war, Armadale was a small country town with a very narrow main street, Beatty Street. My husband's family had the New England Hotel on the corner of Beatty and Danga Street. So I got the bright idea of entertainment, and Peter was my bright idea. She loves to hear the music, start every lyric down. She loves to hear them say that she's got the greatest is in town. She got a great song about his wife. As a child, her own back of life. And each time she took it, she took it home. But she'll always wake up alone. He made a lot of money in threepences and sixpences at that particular time. People loved to hear him and loved to hear him play the piano. It was a good thing they did because Peter's family often needed the money. But Peter's job singing at the New England Hotel came to an end tragically at age 13. The family left town after Peter's father committed suicide. Yeah, he killed himself when I was 13, and that's kind of why uh, I left school, kind of left town, and I left school and went to relatives in another town. Well, it really affected my mother uh, more, than, more than it did me. Baby cried the day the circus came to town. Cause she didn't want parades just passing by her. So she painted on a smile and took up with some clown. And she danced without a net up on the wire. I know a lot about her, cause you see, baby is an awful lot like me. talk to him about the great way he lives life. And he said, well, my mother, we learned it from my mother. My mother could have either crawled up in a hole or just lived life. And that's what he learned. And he said his sister and he learned that from her. They left behind the dreams among the letter. And the different kind of love she thought she found. There was nothing more than sawdust and some glitter. But baby can't be broken, cause you see, she's had the finest teacher of me. I taught her, don't cry. I suppose he felt that women had to be looked after. Yeah. Uh -huh.
Stylistic OTC. Go to Trio Plus, TrioTV.com slash plus. When I left school, I was only 14, and uh, I had a job in a store for, you know, about three weeks, and I thought, well, this is stupid. I, just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be good and work, uh, have a regular life, and then I thought, it's just easy to go to clubs and things and um, play the piano. So I, I got jobs, and I started, and that was it. Peter joined a singing duo. They called themselves the Allen Brothers. Great guys are gonna clear up, put on a happy face. Brush off the clouds and cheer up, put on a happy face. Take off the gloomy mask of tragedy, it's not your style. It became a 10-year training ground for Peter. Pick out a pleasant outlook, Stick out that noble chin. Wipe off that full of doubt look. Slap on a happy grin. Peter was intelligent. He also had a knack for learning fast. One of his first great teachers was a visiting American nightclub entertainer, a wild woman, Frances Faye. Good evening. Good evening. Frances Faye taught Peter timing and also how to be outrageous and get away with it. Once a jolly swag man came. the 60s, the Allen brothers were already overexposed, so they set out for Asia to entertain mainly American troops and tourists. It was at the Hilton Hotel in Hong Kong that Peter met his fate in the form of an American actor, Mark Heron, who turned out to be travelling with a very great star, Judy Garland. Judy Garland discovered Peter, and he'd go on to learn a lot from her. She flew the Allen brothers to London, where Peter witnessed this legendary concert performance. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Liza Minnelli. Judy was matchmaking. Her daughter Liza was aged 18. Peter, 20. Judy was convinced they'd be right for one another. Now, Peter had his future mapped out for him. We may not go far, but sure as a star, wherever we are, it's together. Wherever I go, I know she goes. Wherever I go, I know she goes. No fits, no bites, no fears, and no egos. Amigos, together. We get through them, all out or all in. And whether it's wind, place, or show. Peter married into a turbulent but nevertheless great show business family. The wedding 
also served to bring his own family back together again. From now on, they'd remain close, despite time and distance. But by the late 60s, Peter's floor show singing act had missed the boat. 1969, a whole era was coming to an end. Peter's singing act finally broke up the very day he separated from Liza. Manhattan had been his playground. Now, he was on his own. Once there was a time when this town was so high we could never come down. I think I can write. And it was interesting. It changed his perspective. And there's a whole other person to then just, you know, shaking and everything. He's not that much fun, but <laughs> he is there and we have to acknowledge him. The sensitive songwriter. Something like John Denver, you know, the type. Though a lot of people will always think of Peter as this extraordinary showman, you know, and uh, this, this amazing entertainer. To me, that, that came second uh, to what I think his soul was really about. He spoke in his songs as though he was having a conversation. The late George Wolno worked on High Street and lived on manners. 52 years he sat on his veranda and made his saddles. And if you had questions about sheep or flowers or dogs, you just ask the saddler. He lived without sin. They're building a library for him. Time is a traveler, Tenderfield saddler, turn your head. And ride again, Jackaroo, think I see kangaroo up ahead. Son of George Woolno, and often got married, and had a war baby. But something was wrong, and 
Peter perform was New Year's Eve, 1970 something. I don't know. And he was, and it was a tiny little room. And he was all. He not only played the piano, he used it as furniture and steps. He climbed on top of it. He sang, dancing on top of it. He went under it. He curled behind, back over the piano. See things that are physically impossible to do. And and, uh, and when you're sitting that close to somebody, you know if you have the real stuff or not. And he was just, he was the real stuff. And when we went to see him at a gay bar, he played a gay bar right outside of Washington, which it was pouring rain. I was there in my limo, and I slipped and I fell in all this mud. And I said, is this what I'm getting into now? Marketing meeting, uh, there were an awful lot of fag jokes, and we knew what those were about. They were about Peter. So Jerry Moss uh, kind of got word of some of this paranoia and just said, Peter Allen is an artist. Peter Allen is a great artist. He's a great singer-songwriter. He is going to be on AM for a long time. And uh, everything else is incidental. His lifestyle is his own. It's not yours, it's his. And that was it. And I'm not saying it stopped, but I'm saying it wasn't as manifest and as, as publicly stated. And some of them probably would be wondering about me, because, you know, they don't know much about me at all. They'd probably be wondering quite a bit about me. And uh, if uh, they'd probably say, you know, well, I mean, can you imagine a couple sitting at home watching and saying, well, do you think you know, yeah. is he, do you think, or not? Well, I have to admit that um, I am Australian. What about Liza? You told me at the, at the other night, you said Liza grabbed you and was... Uh... She said, where did you learn to do that? You didn't know how to do that when we were together. I said, I didn't know a lot of things when we were together. <laughs> the first the first gay artist on this label that proclaimed himself as gay
So he came into New York. He, I picked him up, and he, I said, "Come on, you want to go over and see the place?" So he said, "Yeah." So we went out. We went on stage, and he looked up, and he sees this huge cavernous hall. He said, "My God!" He said, "How do you expect me to fill this?" I said, "You've already filled it four times." He said, "What?" I said, "Yes, we've sold out four shows, and we had sold out four shows, which was like." What, 24,000 people already? And this year has been so amazing for me. So amazing. All my fantasies are coming true and we're only two weeks into the year. How many of you had this fantasy as a child? When you first came to Radio City, you thought, oh, if only I could get up and dance with the Rockettes and everything. So I had all the buses going up Madison, coming down Fifth, going all across town. And it was, in those days, it was reasonably cheap. I was able to do it for a good price. So you saw Peter Allen all over the place. See, and with that, we did so, so big, and the show was so successful, now we knew we had it. We were bringing in a lot of people, a big cross-section of people came to see him. We got incredible reviews.
I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable I'm not trying to make you anything at all It's just this feeling doesn't come along every day And you shouldn't blow a chance when you got the chance to say If we both were born in another place and time, this moment might be ending in a kiss. But there you are with yours, and here I am with mine. I guess I'll just be leaving it out there. Absolutely. Gus. Peter was a strange guy in this respect. Once he conquered something, he didn't look like he wanted to go back and do it again. He went on to do Legs Diamond, and it was a sad, sad thing. And this is one time where I told him this, and he just went ballistic. By the late 80s, a sense of anxiety hung over New York. Its creative community had been decimated by the rise of a disease, AIDS. Whether he's written about going to Rio or, as you just heard, a plea for social tolerance, Peter Allen moves people. Love don't need a reason. And I especially thank someone who's been with me for, for seven years doing this. He does everything but walk out instead of me. And that's um, the guy who staged the whole show. And let it to, that's Gregory Cannell. I thank you. I love you all. But soon, and, uh, Greg would be gone. Uh, and there would be fewer and fewer people to thank. Would you come back and see me? Peter bought a New York penthouse. And in the winter of 1989, his musical finally opened. Legs Diamond did what few shows ever dare. It just opened shop on Broadway. No tryouts, no fix-up period out of town, and no sympathy from the critics. Dustin Hoffman said to me, Peter, just remember, in everyone's life, there is an Ishtar. So... <laughs> <laughs> I got to sit down and say, I got to thank some people. I mean, like they said in Brooklyn, we was rough. <laughs> but, uh, after the reviews, as uh, vicious and unjust as they were, and now. Uh... Uh, I think somebody else word anyone but Peter. I think it would have absolutely destroyed them. Did anyone see Legs Diamond? I didn't mind. Yeah, it wasn't that bad, was it? I mean, what was wrong? It's the critics, it's the critics. What do they know? Well, they can close you, it's the only problem. And that's, you know what made me mad? Not the closing of the show, because we ran for two months and I got it out of my system and stuff, didn't make a dime, that's why I'm back here. But... <laughs> Yeah, he, he, man, he didn't care. Because he knew that no, nothing was going to take him down anyway. You know, I mean, he, he, uh, he was in his own space, you know. 
You know I'd dance and I'd sing I'd do anything Just to get my name in lights Some old props left over from Lex Diamond Gotta try to hit the heights Now that I'm free as a breeze again I remember uh, hearing songs on the on the radio, and they say that was a, a Peter Allen song. It's songs that I, I'd known my whole life. I'm like, gosh, I had I had no idea he wrote that, you know. And once before I go, I want you to know that I would do it all again. It's just a lyric. Come on. I'm sure I'd make the same mistakes, but we can make it through the pains and joys and aches we knew back then. sang Making Every Moment Count, and he was sick that night. He was actually very ill that night. He didn't feel well. He had fever, and, but he came. We love Dave. Wait. Let me get one thing clear. You're great, but I gotta stop right here. It's actually a new song. I figured you'd sit still for it while uh, you're waiting for Rio. I've been burned, so I got to cool things down. Right now I'm numb. This might be love, but how? Now I should fall for you. Not now, not after what I've been through. I've been burned, so I got to cool things down. And though right now I'm numb, and I'll see you in the springtime When I'm ready to begin again I'll be back to love you when the snow's gone So hold on Just find a place inside your heart And look for me when love does start to sing as hard as he ever had, and he traveled. After he'd been to Venice and Greece, he went on an African safari. Take a break, and in a while, right after this winter's through, when my lesson is learned, I will return for you. And I'll see you in the springtime. Alan was performing in Sydney, Australia, when he fell ill. And uh, I was diagnosed with um, uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma, which was malignant. So I, I was set to go into a hospital at St Vincent's to be operated on. And I, I was sort of just sitting there, and all of a sudden, it was my sister who said, there's Peter Allen behind you. And I said, no. 
And then all of a sudden I listened, because I didn't want to be rude and sort of spin around. I heard Peter's voice. And I turned around and I said, Peter? And he said, Judy? And I said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm here just to have a, a test, um, Brian Sheridan. And I said, <clears throat> I'm here for Brian Sheridan, which is the doctor, our doctor. I'm here for Dr. Sheridan as well, because Peter knew then. He knew that, that he was going to die. Even when Peter was ill, you know, and I, and I spoke to him, I asked him if he was afraid, you know. I asked him, uh, and he said he wasn't. He said he wasn't afraid. It was in this San Diego hospital that the man who calls Australia home finally bowed out of the world of show business. The entertainer Peter Allen has died of an AIDS-related illness in San Diego. Died in the United States at the age of 48 from AIDS-related cancer, which was discovered four months ago. When you think about his life and you think about what he lived through and what he became and how he took it all and put it in his work, you know, even in one song, Tenterfield Sadler, you know. Um, he just had a, uh, a zest for living. And he said to me, thank God I lived, you know. And I thought, you know, thank God he did live. Thank God for us and thank God for him, you know. And he said, I, I just feel so tired if I if I, if I don't do the show and they don't like me, they're going to say, uh, look, he's had it. And if I don't turn up, they're not going to like me because I didn't turn up. And he was so concerned about his audience. But the songs live on. Time is a traveler, tenderfield saddler, turn your head. Ride again, jackaroo, think I see kangaroo. The son of George Wono went off and got married and had a war baby. But something was wrong, and it's easier to drink than go crazy. And if there were questions about why the end was so sad, well, George had no answer to why his son ever had need of a gun time is a traveler tenderfield saddler turn your head ride again jackaroo think i see kangaroo up ahead I forgot too. I threw away the papers in such a cavalier gesture. You see that? God, I'm such a. I just fell away like I was okay. My God. See, it's a family saga. See, there's the, the you know the grandfather, and there's the, uh, the the son who was a little disturbed, and then there's the grandson who was supposed to be Peter. Peter, please, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> He'd love it. He'd love it. I know he's laughing wherever he is. So put your hands together. Help her along. All oh, that's left, what's left of the sun. Right. To the occasion and give her one last celebration. Put your hands together. 